Hello and welcome to this webinar on payments for ecosystem services to support forest and landscape restoration. Um, my name is Lucy Garrett, I'm from the Food and Agriculture Organisation of the United Nations and I will be co-hosting this webinar with Disha Chandra from the WWF Landscape Finance Lab as part of our joint community of practice for finance on forest and landscape restoration. So this community of practice uh, for finance, um, it aims to provide a forum for discussion and network uh, for practitioners to share their experiences in this field, build capacity and also connect on issues around financing uh, for restoration and implementation on the ground. This webinar is part of a series of webinars that we have co-hosted um, on various finance topics and their role in FLR through a practitioner's lens. And um, also just as a bit of a, a background for today, you will see um, using Zoom that we have a chat function just below um, your screen where we encourage you to share any comments or um, resources that you'd like to share. But also there is a Q&A button just below as well. And that's where we encourage you to share questions for the speakers. And, and we will try and encourage any questions that get shared in the chat feed to be posted in the Q&A section. Um, and these will be answered at the end of the call and where we don't get around to answering all of the questions we encourage you to continue the discussion on the dgroup space which we've posted to most of you and if you don't have access please do get in touch with us at the end of the the session and we'll make sure that you get connected Thank you. Well, we, we are very grateful to have uh, Dr. Beria Lemona from the World Agroforestry Centre, ECRAF, uh, and Dr. Thuy Pham from the Centre for International Forestry Re Research, C4, with us to present today um, on the key principles and concepts of payments for ecosystem services, the key roles for different landscape actors and different stakeholders in designing and implementing PEDS on the ground, and also looking at the opportunities and risks associated with these different elements of design and implementation. And they'll also be using and showing different case study examples of how PEZs can operate in practice and the lessons learned from studies with this. Dr. Barry Limona will now take the floor to introduce herself and present for us. Hello, greetings everyone. I believe you all keep healthy and sound in these very unusual times. So my name is Beria Leimona from World Agroforestry, or popularly called ICRAF, International Center for Research in Agroforestry, based in Indonesia. So today I would like to share you some information and empirical lessons coming from the observations, analysis, and pilot of payment for ecosystem services mostly implemented in Southeast Asia and Africa, led by ICRAF. The structure of presentation will be a brief history of ecosystem services and payment for ecosystem services, then continued with the evolving concept and definitions of PES briefly, and lessons from a case study in Rejoso Watershed, Indonesia. It's about the various business models applied beyond the PES. So in short, there are two points of key messages I would like to share. Firstly, the PES is not a standalone mechanism, but as a part of broader landscape governance and development programs. And secondly, uh, many of you may remember in early 2000, IAED published a report titled Silver Bullet or Full Scope. It's a global review of markets for forest and environmental services and their impact on the poor. So it's based on 287 cases from both developed and developing countries. Inspiring by the title, what we learned from PES, it is neither a silver bullet nor full scope. So it's a briefly on the history of PES, the paper by Gomez Pogetun and Blochtefruit and others, review how the concept of ecosystem services developed. It examined the critical landmarks in economic theory and practice with regard to the incorporations of ecosystem services into markets and payment schemes. So ecosystem services, as you may know, it's benefits that human gain from the ecosystem. It's a concept framed in early 70s. And it's culminated uh, in early 2003 by the launch of Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, or MEA, as a global policy agenda on ES. 
So the idea, firstly, the idea was to attract increased attention that human welfare is highly dependent on ecosystem as a life support system. At present, uh, ecosystem services are increasingly reaching economic decision making through the widespread promotion of market-based instruments for conservation, such as markets for ecosystem services and so-called the payment for ecosystem services schemes. So almost two decades ago, ICRA, with the support from IFAD, the International Funds for Agriculture Development, initiated a program to assess and pilot how PES can support both ES provisioning and poverty alleviations in developing countries. Those programs are rewarding upland poor for environmental services, or in short, LUPES in Asia, uh, started in 2002 up to 2012, it's almost a decade long program. And the Pro Poor Rewards for Environmental Services in Africa in 2006 up to 2010. So, in early 20s, as mentioned in the previous slide, there was high expectations on market based solutions. Among developing countries, you may know that Costa Rica was a front runner transforming a forest subsidy program to an outcome-based Pago Por Servicios Ambientales program, or PES in Spanish, I guess, in 1997. Elsewhere, uh, similar ideas came out, and you may also recall that the Kyoto Protocol, also in 1997, opened perspectives on global carbon markets. Meanwhile, it became clear that payments for free requirements, including clarity on land use rights and tenure, that are not met in large part of the developing world. So the innovations brought by these Rupes and Presa were that ecosystem services are generated by different farming system. So if you remember uh, the uh, IIED publication, it stressed on the forest services, but here we also thinking that smallholders could contribute as environmental stewardships and that rewards could be an important means for giving farmers incentives to maintain social, socially beneficial land uses and the PES designed to be performed. So that's uh, somehow we uh, consider as the innovations of the program for developing countries. So on the left uh, side of the slide, it is the cover of ebook that share more complete views on PES as lessons learned from Rupes and Presa, and then you can download it freely. So to reach the development sectors, uh, there are a move from the original emphasis on tests of market-based solutions towards increased emphasis on how to embrace poverty alleviation goals. And uh, the lessons from Rupes and Presa envision that PES has three perspectives. So the first one is about the commoditizations of ES. So it is about how to cash environmental services as commodities on potential markets. With the unit of trade is ecosystem services itself. The most obvious example is the carbon market for sure. And uh, second, we emphasize that PES also could be interpreted as compensation for involuntary or voluntary restrictions on land use and practices. In this case, the indicator for compliance is ecosystem service friendly activities as the proxy for ecosystem service outcomes. For example, it is assumed by that by planting more trees, there is an increase in biodiversity. So this applies in many PES cases all over the world. Uh, including the Costa Rica, so they also use this proxy of compensation. And lastly, uh, co-investment for ecosystem services that consider PES is accomplished when it is formed by respect, mutual accountability, and commitment of different stakeholders involved in this system, ranging from smallholders to private sector towards the commitment to the broader goal, which is the sustainable development. So this compensation and co-investment for PES uh, are usually called as the semi or hybrid PES without any further clarifications what they are exactly. 
So we we'll, are uh, we are uh, we learned that fairness and efficiency objective of PES must be achieved simultaneously in designing and implementing a sustainable PES scheme, especially in developing country contracts for sure. Uh, so in summary, the emerging experience in Asia and Africa is well aligned. So these cases clearly show that PES is an evolutionary process of landscape governance involving multi-stakeholder and PES is not an end result itself. So applying the principle for, co uh, for ecosystem service co-investment, uh, this slide shows several elements that are relevant in applications of PES in practice. So the PES has several stages, starting from scoping or data collections to design the scheme and its business case, then continued by developing the governance of the scheme such as finding the relevant stakeholder, the ecosystem service provider who are the beneficiaries, and negotiating the terms of contract usually facilitated by an intermediary. NGO usually takes this facilitator role. At each stage of PS, there is different expectations of the roles of the government. In the beginning of the schemes, as the PS is a complex process and somehow new, for environmental policy and regulations, so at least the government might provide enabling conditions. For example, by providing good basis on, of uh, baseline data to support the compliant measurement of PES. At the later stage of the scheme, those are implementations and upscaling. So there is a strong need for government to target the development programs to PES participants. This is due to, in most cases, as you may know, that the financial payments cannot cover the opportunity cost of smallholder in joining the PES conservation contract. The early stages of PES, particularly from the initiation, design, and monitoring and evaluation uh, indicator development, usually are financed by donor or philanthropic organization through grants and technical assistance. When the PES infrastructure and governance have not in place yet, the settings of PES can be an effective conservation instrument. Yet, it is an expensive one. Thus, if we connect the role of government to ensure that PES can be applied in larger scale, the government might provide enabling infrastructures to reduce high transaction costs. So when the PES has been operational, there might be a chance that the conservation budget is exhausted. As a result, there is maybe no more budget to pay for the PES contracts. So therefore, from our experience, the designs of PES must consider what's happening when the contract stops or the budget is exhausted. Will farmers still practice uh, their business as usual? Will they come back to their previous um, farming system, which is maybe harmless for the environment. So it will be necessary to alter farming system under the PES contracts toward ecosystem service business models. In this case, the financing scheme that can de-risk the farmers in stepping into such green business and improve their agricultural uh, agribusiness bankability are very important. So at this stage, the financing schemes such as concessional loan or agricultural loan, below market interest rate loan by grace periods or combinations of both will be required to ensure the sustainability of ES-friendly farming practices by the farmers. This loan can be facilitated both government uh, by government through public funding or private sectors through impact funds, for example. The next slides uh, will show you a case of PES in Indonesia that is designed to experiment with the various, these various financing schemes as, as I mentioned in the previous slides. For the complete information, uh, a report has been published and freely uh, downloaded it, uh, online. The Rejoso watershed, uh, it's about 60,000 hectares, is located in Pasuruan District, East Java Province, Indonesia. 
So this uh, Rejoso is quite ideal to pilot a PEA scheme. The watershed strategically functions as a source of clean water for domestic and industries in Pasuruan district and its surrounding cities, including to the metropolitan capital of the province of East Java. In the midst of this watershed, there is a spring that is entitled as a strategic national water source project. It has the highest debit in the Java Island. So this is very important water source. And the Rajasu watershed provides vital livelihoods for the Pasuruan communities, such as farming of annual and perennial crops in its upstream. So you may see on the slide, there are some pictures of Rajasu. The top one is the upstream, uh, where uh, perennial crops are located agroforestry in its midstream, and its downstream is dominated by irrigated paddy cultivations and monoculture plantations. So as you may know that uh, the Java Island is the most densely populated island in Indonesia. Population growth and economic pressure are causing dramatic changes in the Rejoso watershed, and the demand of water is extremely high. The Rejoso Phase 1 and 2, supported by the Danone Ecosystem Fund and the CGIR Forest, Trees and Agroforestry Research Program, among other donors. The Phase 1 in 2006 up 2018 focused in three major activities. Firstly, linking the scientific approaches to on the ground actions. Secondly, ensuring that the program is cost effective and also cost efficient for restoring and maintaining the watershed functions compared to the business as usual through the pilot of PES in the upstream and the midstream. So here we are also conducting what's so called the reverse auction to ensure that this cost efficiency is achieved. Lastly, uh, we are also uh, working on stimulating the multi-stakeholder in, uh, uh, in restoring and uh, also ensuring that the co-investment coming from various stakeholders. So the next slides show you the steps and how we target the PES participants and determine the contract value. By conducting the conservation auctions, as I mentioned earlier, in this case, two conservation auctions were conducted one in the downstream and one in the midstream, as the two landscapes have different characteristics. Thus, the applications, the, as, uh, uh, thus, as the implication types of this PES contract and values must be different as well. So the map on the right, uh, on the left, I mean, uh, show the GPS points of very wide PES participants' land. So those dots, represent the farmers that won the auction. So below, you also can see some pictures uh, showing the PES measurement activities. To measure the PES impacts on both activity-based through tree tagging and digital recording and installing simple tools to measure infiltrations and sedimentation rate. These simple monitoring instruments enable the local communities to jointly conduct the measurement and to show the impact at the watershed level conducted a series of hydrological modeling and projections of benefits gained by the small holders when joining the ecosystem service friendly farming practices. Next slide please. The Rojoso phase two is focusing on the downstream of Rajoso watershed. The implementations of phase two is to ensure that the intervention towards integrated watershed and water resource management is comprehensive from the upstream towards the downstream, applying various conservation and development instruments. The overall objective is to improve optimal water uses for both agriculture and domestic consumptions. For Agriculture 1, the project targets in piloting low emissions and water efficient paddy cultivations as the paddy field is the most important farming system in the downstream. 
and to introduce what's so called the water credit that puts microfinance tool to use the water and sanitation uh, in, uh, in the water and sanitation sector. So in the case of Rejoso, the idea is that the farmers who have reduced their water consumptions for their uh, agriculture use can become the legal water supplier for their neighboring villages that may experience drought, uh, particularly in dry season. This mechanism can be done through cooperatives or other village enterprises. Current practice it is that there are many unregulated private water trucks selling water privately to local communities in need. Next slide, please. So this will be my second last slide. Three financing schemes are designed for the JOSO. Firstly, for upstream and midstream, PS becomes the basis for strengthening local governance and collective actions of the ecosystem service provider or the farmers in improving the water infiltration capacity of the watershed and reducing sedimentations from intensive farming lands. And for sure, as you may know, that financial return from PES might be low. But again, we doesn't, uh, we, it, doesn't, uh, it is not meant to be designed as income improvement, but towards include, uh, improving the social and ecological capital. Secondly, in the downstream, the practice of water credit will, uh, will be applied as an investment through microfinance and support from public funds to construct water infrastructure and grant to provide uh, the technical assistance as in the current situation. The water user and as, uh, the water user associations and cooperative are still weak and are not designed to implement water credit scheme. Thus, we need uh, these uh, external technical assistance. Thirdly, all farmers who produce various agricultural commodities such as vegetable and potato in upstream, cowbee and fruits in the midstream, and paddy in the downstream, are the process of being connected by, uh, so this uh, third one is uh, how to connect these farmers to various of takers that are concerned to the healthy and organic products coming from the PES farmers as the priorities. And finally, the impact investment or investments made by company or organization uh, to generate a measurable and beneficial social and environmental impact alongside with a financial return is relevant here as the business model are relatively clear. Those are thin commodities. So in the JOSO case, we target various businesses such as corporates and agricultural startups that are focusing on supports to Indonesian farmer. Uh, digital markets with further provision of crowd lending will support the farmers in transitioning from the business as usual towards the green business. So lastly, uh, my last slide. Uh, as the key messages, uh, I have a couple here for you. Uh, first, the concept of PES has been evolved from the strict understanding on market-based ecosystem services to broader landscape governance involving conservation development incentive instruments. Second, evidence-based PES is essential to ensure measurable impacts and attract potential for upscaling. So with the ultimate goal to target impact investment towards larger scales of implementations. So as you may remember that the argument how to scale up PES is, uh, is very important. Third, financing scheme is, should be beyond the PES payment itself. And sustainability of PES by engaging assorted evidence and performance-based and for sure, proper financing instruments are very essential. And lastly, this might be sounds very common, to encourage the government to keep similar paces with the underground innovations, simply because that non-supportive regulation can become disincentives for a well-designed pilot of PES. 
especially when the project grant and technical assistance have ended. Uh, that's all my presentation. Um, maybe uh, this is just a note that what the future conservation set development will bring for the next generation. Maybe something about the next generation we need to think beyond the current one. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all from me now. Thank you, Levona. Um, before we move on to uh, Dr. Three Fam's presentation, I just have one clarification question, please. Just with regards, if you could explain very briefly, because obviously with time, um, what are conservation auctions, please, for some of our participants and how they're used? Uh, conservation auctions is a reverse auctions to gain the value of willingness to accept so rather than having uh, the over increasing over so the one that over lower contract will win the conservation contract so this is uh, a, a way to target participants with uh, high cost effectiveness I, I hope that's clear enough. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure if participants have further questions about that, they can post um, a bit more on D group and, okay, and, and sure. engage yeah. with them afterwards. So yeah. thank you very much for that. And now uh, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Thuy Pham to uh, give a very brief introduction about herself and uh, go straight into her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Lucy. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and maybe also good morning to many of you because we are in different time zone. Uh, my name is Pak Thuthi and I'm a senior scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research and I'm based in Vietnam. So today I would like to share a little bit about practical experience on C4 research uh, where we have been engaging with uh, payment for environmental services for the last two decades and I myself have been engaged with um, uh, in many countries to support a policy maker and also a project to develop payment for environmental services and then project. So today we would like to reflect a little bit uh, the practical experience on the ground, how countries have designed their uh, past policy, how, how projects have designed their policies and what are the current opportunity and challenges for them to implement payment for environmental services on the ground. So um, for the presentation today, I would like to cover several aspects First of all, um, I would like to give a little bit an overview at the global scale. Uh, what type of payment for environmental services scheme has been implemented? What type of uh, environmental services and ecosystem services are being stripped and being protected under the PES scheme? We then go into the key principle in designing a payment for environmental services that C4 has had uses and applying it for the last two decades to support government across the world and also project designer across the world to think about um, the project, their policies, and also to evaluate these policies and the project based on these three principles. We would also like to share some key lessons learned based on the application and using the 3E framework. And uh, um, if Lemona already presenting a great and excellent case study on how the project in Indonesia have designing and implemented payment for environmental services. In my presentation, I would like to provide a national scheme on payment for environmental services to reflect a different scale on how payment for environmental services can be implemented and, and perhaps give you an overview about the tests um, at the national level and how difficult and also how um, what are the opportunities for the government to design a national scheme and later on a final key message? So, first of all, looking at the global scale, uh, for the last couple of years, C4 has reviewed more than 400 uh, past policies and also projects across the world. And what we have seen is that among all of the environmental services that are being shared, uh, with the shed protection, as you can see on the slide, is the most commonly um, shared environmental services. And if you're looking at the numbers of pest schemes across the world and also the policy that are in place, uh, most of them target on watershed protection. And uh, even though uh, we are now um, increasing interest uh, to protect biodiversity and biodiversity conservation has been become the national interest in many countries. If you're looking at the graph, 
Uh, the members of PES scheme focus on biodiversity conservation. It just roughly accounted for 26% of the total numbers of PES scheme uh, in the world. What we wanted to draw a special attention um, into the forestry sector is most, if, if you can see on the graph, among all of the cases on payment for environmental services, only 1% of the PES scheme was actually devoted to protect mangrove uh, environmental services while the rest is maintained and focused on inland forests. Um, we all know that uh, mangrove play a significant role in both climate change mitigation and adaptation. And our study clearly showed the need to pay more attention and also more support uh, to mangrove protection. And uh, there was an increasing interest to develop payment for environmental services for mangrove, particularly in Southeast Asia and in my own country, Vietnam. So uh, Lemona has explained for you quite um, useful principles and also the key underlying message to designing and implementing tests. Uh, for C4, uh, to simplify a little bit on the protocol in many countries and also in many projects, um, the principle that we use to support other stakeholders and also the government agency in designing, implementing and also monitoring payment for environmental services are based on three key principles. First of all, the principles of effectiveness, whatever the policies and the project need to do, it has to address the, um, the objective of the policy, which aim to um, enhance and also protect environmental services. In, in many cases across the world, the objective of the national pest policies, as Lemona has said, is not just only to enhance the qualities, the quantities of environmental services, but also to improve um, local livelihood and reduce poverty. And um, in a way that the action and also the policies framework need to be designed in a way that it has the policy to achieve its intended goal. The second element that uh, pest designers and pest practitioners need to take into account when they're designing and implementing their pest policies and looking from the efficiency perspective, look at cost. What we also have seen across the world in most of the time, when you talk about the efficiency, you do need to think um, and also to balance between both cost and benefit because many programs was offering in terms of the benefit, but do not take into account and also um, think about the cost that you need to invest to implementing those options. And most of the time, the implementation costs and also the uh, social, uh, the implementation costs and also the transaction costs are the two factors that prevented many private sector um, stakeholder and agency not to invest in PES. So these elements need to be taken into account. Another thing that we also wanted to take um, uh, your attention, in, in terms of the cost, most of the time people think about economic cost. But in designing payment for environmental services, not only economic costs need to be considered, but also social costs of action need to be taken into account because many value of ecosystem services cannot be easily monetized and materialized, such as cultural services and also the cultural value. So there is a need to take into account those considerations. The third principle in designing, implementing, and also monitoring on payment for environmental services is taking a, an equity perspective. Whether or not the, the benefits are shared equitably, whether or not good governance has been implemented so that everyone, including both the seller, the buyer, but then also who are affected by the decision of the best scheme are actually being given a chance to voice their concern and to participate in this process. So the other key principle that at least we need to take into account both uh, in the designing, implementing, and also the monitoring of impact. So from the global perspective, the first um, principles on effectiveness, what we have seen, and, and that is based on a global comparative study on REP Plus that C4 has been doing since 2009 until now, and many other projects on payment for environmental services, that C4 has been implemented in Southeast Asia since 2002. Um, what we have seen is the countries, uh, in the countries where the national pest uh, mechanisms and policy aligning with the national priority, that's where the, the payment for environmental services are likely to be successful more compared to the other. The other thing what we also wanted to highlight is in terms of effectiveness. In order to demonstrate the effectiveness and also to monitoring the effectiveness of the program, which is the core intention of policy maker and also best practitioner, you need to have a proper monitoring and evaluation in place. 
And unfortunately, if you're looking at the global scale, you have very little study, very little evidence to confirm its effectiveness. Because first of all, most countries didn't put um, a, a clear and a functionable monitoring and evaluation system that can track down the impact of pests after all. Another thing is, uh, with the, in order to provide a rigorous impact assessment about the effectiveness of pest scheme, you need to employ a rigorous evaluation method. And very little case study across the world, when you're looking at monitoring the effectiveness of PFAS, they're looking, comparing between before and after pests implemented, comparing between the, the area where you have pests and the area where you do not have pests, so that you can actually draw out the effectiveness and the additionalities of pests on the ground. And, and Leo also has said in her presentation, on the ground, you do not only have just pest program, you have multiple policies in place to protect forests and also to protect ecosystem services. So how you can attribute the effectiveness of pests and how you can actually say that that is the impact of pests, but not the other programs, because multiple policies are acting in place. And it is extremely important to evaluate the effectiveness of pests, given the fact that you are operating in a landscape with a policy mix. In terms of efficiencies point of view, um, the lesson learned have showing consistently uh, in literature review, but also on the ground, is because there were, you have a different um, socioeconomic, different, uh, socioeconomic status of environmental services. You also facing with different ecologic, um, socioeconomic context of different regions across the world, and even within the same countries. Usually, if the payment for environmental services scheme apply a uniform payment, which is the same payment across the landscape, it is very unlikely to achieve um, the successful outcome of pest policy because the level of payment in one place might be sufficient, but might not be sufficient in the other country. The other lesson learned at the global scale is, a, as Lemina said, usually the level of payment for payment for environmental services is very slow, uh, very low, and therefore it cannot compete with the high opportunities cost um, of other alternative land use. And therefore, there is a need to look uh, in terms of bundling multiple environmental services and develop a payment scheme that be able to bundling multiple environmental services and therefore being able to incentivize the local people and of course, um, in terms of designing, as I mentioned in the very first slide, you also need to think about the cost and benefit of the option at the same time. Because to overlook either cost or benefit, it will be very difficult to incentivize the people and also to provide an efficient solution to the landowner to protect uh, forests and also to protect ecosystem services. In terms of the equity lesson, what we have seen across the world is where you have a high participation of multiple stakeholders into the process, where you have a clear and transparency information sharing, and you, where you have a clarity in rights and responsibility. Um, when you set up the PFAS contract, that's where you hardly have the opportunity to make the case successful. What we also have seen so far is in more developing countries, in Asia and in Africa, most of the time, uh, the voice and the concerns of the most vulnerable group, the poor and the indigenous group, are not often taken into account. And it leads to many consequences. Either you got a strong rejection from the communities not to participate in PES, or you do not have a full buy-in of the contracts. So they might participate in PES for a couple of years, but then they walk out of the contracts immediately after um, a few years of implementation. So that is some of the key lessons learned at the global scale. So now I wanted to take a little bit of case study from the National Scheme on Payment for Forest Environmental Services Scheme in Vietnam. The reason why we wanted to take the case study from the National Payment for Environmental Services in Vietnam is because it is the only one to date, uh, the National Scheme on Pests that are initiated in Asia. And uh, because for the last, even though the program were just uh, initiated since 2008, up to now, the, the contribution of pests already contribute to 25% of the overall investment to the forestry sector in Vietnam. And it has been marked as one of the 10 biggest uh, policy breakthrough uh, in, the decades, uh, in the last decades in Vietnam. And uh, the fact that the, the success of the program, uh, being able to generate the amount of money that doubled the state budget allocation to the forestry sector, 
uh, providing an, an useful lesson learned on how the countries has been implementing this program and to reduce the state budgets on forestry sector. Um, with the national scheme on payment for environmental services in Vietnam, it has three objectives. First of all, the, the first objective is to improve um, the forest qualities and quantity of forests over time. The second objective is also to reduce the burden on the state budgets that I mentioned and also to improve local livelihood. The third objective is to really mobilize the private sector uh, in funding uh, for forest protection and development activities. And the way that this works in Vietnam is we, there are five environmental services under the national pass scheme. The first, of, the first environmental services are watershed protection. The second one is on biodiversity conservation. The third one is on landscape beauty. The fourth one is on red loss on reduced emission from deforestation and degradation. And the fifth one is on mangrove protection, looking at aquaculture's um, services that mangrove provide. Uh, but so far, only watershed protection and landscape beauties are implemented and the other three schemes that are supposed to be below for the other three remaining environmental services are still being under construction. So with the watershed protection and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the landscape beauty, we basically pay in through our water bill and also electricity bill through the government trust fund. And then the government trust fund win on our behalf to distribute the benefit and the payment to the landowners in Vietnam. So in terms of the effectiveness, even though there was a lot of report uh, for the last 10 years saying that the thanks to the past, the forest qualities and also the forest quality has been improved over times in Vietnam. What we have found out in our study is the fact that because the, the government of Vietnam is still at the very infant state, of developing a proper monitoring and evaluation system. So in a way, there is no proper monitoring and evaluation in place that can provide for us a scientific evidence on a proper increase of both forest qualities and quantity. The second thing that we also document is with, with case study across Vietnam, we saw that uh, there was a very low enforcement on the PFAS contract and also there was an inequitable treatment in violation case. Looking at the current system right now, uh, the current monitoring and evaluation system relies in on the self-reporting of the forest owner on how well they protect the forest with very little verification and also with very little actual monitoring on the ground to validate those claims. So at the same time, uh, we also see that uh, there is a, a nuances in terms of the impact because where you implementing PFAS policy, they also the government also implementing multiple forest protection activities and program. And with our proper monitoring and evaluation system and rigorous impact assessment, it is very difficult to validate the additionalities of the national space scheme. So just again to emphasize the need to demonstrate the effectiveness of any policies and program, you need to have a proper monitoring and evaluation system uh, in place. And you need to have an independent verification to validate whatever it is reported by the forest owner on the ground. In, in terms of efficiencies, what we also wanted to highlight is the fact that in, in the context of Vietnam, where you have a uh, large numbers of forest owner, for example, in many provinces, you have about 100,000 individuals, small households, which implying that implementing PFAS contract is very costly. And the transaction cost and the implementation cost for the government to implement it, those schemes is extremely high. At the same time, the low levels of payment also did not incentivize people to participate in PES because they had a higher income from other alternative land use. Um, it also is showing that uh, there is a lot of hidden costs um, that the households and also the government agency had to put by themselves from their own budgets, but are not fully taken into account during the actual design and implementation of PFAS. For example, at the moment under the management fee, the provincial government can keep maybe about 10% from the total revenue generated from PFAS to cover for their, uh, for their activity to make the contract for PFAS and also to win the forest land allocation. But in practice, the actual money that the government has to use to um, implement the PFAS may be uh, cost about three times or four times higher compared to the actual program, uh, compared to the actual money that the PFAS provide 
can provide to the government funds. So in a way that when you're looking at the efficiency, it's not just only looking at how much the forest owner would receive, how the money would be distributed, but also the implementation cost and the transaction cost for all of the actors in implementing the PFAS option. In terms of uh, the beneficiary mechanism, um, I mean, the government do have a clear policy on beneficiary mechanism, but what we are not yet clear, and that's what our research in Vietnam has been devoted quite a lot to this aspect, is the, 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 the beneficiary mechanism. How, after the money generated and put into the fund, how have it been distributed to the forest owner? Whether or not it's effective, whether or not it's efficiencies, and whether or not it's equitable. And um, what we can see is, is that because of the poor monitoring and evaluation system in place, it is very hard to document the actual social impact of the program. It is very difficult to document whether or not the program has have any communities to, to get out of poverty. It is very, very difficult to put in place um, even uh, a data to have us actually track down where the money is going to and how the money has been used and whether or not it has been reinvested into forest protection activities. And uh, because it's a, the government policies in the protocols of setting up the contract, most of the time the contract was sent to the policy uh, to the forest owner uh, without really asking whether or not they are agreed in terms of the contract clause, in terms of the payment modality, in terms of pay, even in terms of monitoring and evaluation clause. So because of the lack of the involvement of the forest owner in even setting up the contract, it causing a lot of social conflict and prevented many uh, owner to continue to participate on, on PES. One of the things that we also wanted to highlight is a lot of hidden politics in the designing and implementing of payment for environmental services. And um, the, the problems of the rules of the game and the game within the rules is something that most of the time we do not pay attention, but it is actually reflected on the ground. And I want to do the next, the next slide at an example of where we mean with the politics of numbers and the politics of, of, uh, of PES. Maybe just can you go back to the previous slide, Disha? For some reason, some of the slides are missing. But uh, when it comes to the politics of PFAS, I wanted to take an example clearly in, in our national scheme on payment for environmental services in Vietnam. So when we come into several provinces and we wanted to track down uh, the effectiveness of PES program in improving the forest cover and forest quality. And it's extremely difficult for us to even uh, document this impact because five government agencies in the same province providing five different data sets on forest cover showing different patterns. Two of them showing an increasing in the forest cover thanks to PES program. The other three showing the decline in the forest cover. So within the government data themselves, there is a conflict. And there was a reason behind that, because for many government agencies and for many provinces, it is a political mission for the government agency to show that the forest cover had increased over time. Otherwise, they will lose their job. They will lose the funding allocated from the state budgets from the central government to the provincial government because you didn't demonstrate your task very well. So within this nuance, just bear in mind that when you're reporting and evaluating the effective mid of PES, either from effective mid efficiencies and equity perspective, the, the numbers review its own politics. And in a way that the facts and numbers are selected to serve a certain interest and a certain um, objective goal uh, raised by different stakeholders. And therefore, this is very important to have a multi-stakeholder monitoring platform where multiple stakeholders, CSO, can take part in this process. And you need to have an independent verification system, a well-established agreement handling system, so that you can track down the effectiveness uh, or, or pass. So for the next few slides, you will see that it's, it's at a very long detail. And what I wanted to, and I will not go in through all of them, but please feel free to look at it. And then if you have any particular interest, emailing us and we can have a, another discussion via online or email. But what I wanted to say is that usually when it comes to designing PFAS policies or project, everyone thought that it's very simple. You just need to set up a few things and then it's done. And there is a lot of steps that you need to involve, um, as many advisors have said. But the real problems with designing payment for environmental services, either at the policies level or either at the project level, is a devil in the detail. Because 
each of the elements that are listed in my two slides deserve its own special um, attention, not just only doing a proper scientific evidence, but also a proper consultation with different stakeholders in designing it. For example, when you talk about the payment amount, as I said earlier, the payment amount cannot be uniform across the site or even across the province or even across the nation because the payment level needs to reflect, you know, the opportunity cost or source of cost that are particularly specific for a certain context. And therefore, each of the elements, if you need to look at this one, again, what a special attention from both scientific backup, but also a proper uh, consultation. And the decision needs to be made based on an inclusive and participation decision making process. So again, they need another slide with a full detail. So the last slide is on my final key message. We give focus on the key three, uh, key three principles that I mentioned earlier on effectiveness. Emphasize again the need to have a proper monitoring and evaluation in place to track down the effectiveness of the program. Also, the efficiency point of view, bringing the point of view to consider both the social cost, economic cost, and also the benefit attaching to it, and the need to bundling multiple um, environmental services to provide attractive incentive for forest owner. And from the equity perspective, it is very important to ensure to have an inclusive decision making process. The final key message that I wanted to make is that even though it seems to be kind of uh, easy and simple to think about these three uh, principles, designing and implementing PFAS, again, these three uh, principles alone is difficult. But actually harmonizing these three key principles is also challenging because maybe one of the key principle might have to come with a cost of another key principle. For example, if you want to focus on efficiencies, you might come in the cost of equity. And, and therefore, this is kind of not an easy solution. And as Lemona said, I just wanted to emphasize her key point. There is no uh, one size fit all formula, and it has to be played on both scientific evidence and based on an inclusive decision-making process. So this is my final slide. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thuy. Um, Both of you have given us a real um, interesting insight into what PEZ is and how it's been applied on the ground. Um, I am aware of the time. Um, so we are going to extend for another 15 minutes to allow for a few questions. We do have a lot of questions, so I do encourage and welcome all of you to join the D group. Uh, we'll, we'll put that link up again at the end of the webinar, uh, where more discussions will continue later this week for another two weeks uh, from today. And also the questions will be posted and um, answered as the weeks go on. So just... Going through the first few questions, um, we've got some popular questions. So the first one to you both is, how do PES programs address trade-offs and disservices? So e either one of you can answer this one. So it's a um, trade-off. I, I suppose that there are several trade-offs happening in the PES uh, implementations. For example, the first one, uh, exactly what has been presented, it is the trade-off whether we will achieve the ecosystem service efficiency or the equity or the fairness or the pro poor. So in this case, uh, what uh, from my presentations, one of the lessons learned is that uh, for sure that the PS is a process. Firstly, uh, it really contextual in terms of what type of situations you will find on the ground when the, pro when the poverty is very striking and it's become one of the most important agenda for ensuring that a conservation activities has to be done, then it means that uh, a proper scheme, which uh, it's a false into investment, is more relevant. However, as I also mentioned, that there are an evolutionary process of PES. When a goal has been achieved, you can improve, you can redesign the whole scheme towards a more efficient one. So it's either for the efficiency in achieving the ecosystem service outcomes as well as to reduce the, the overall cost. 
So that's uh, what I um, trying to say. Uh, for the disservices, does it mean about the ecosystem disservices? Um, I cannot. I cannot think one, but maybe two if you want to answer about this. But I think this is like, um, what, what would be the example? Uh, how the PS somehow can uh, become what, harm, harmful to, uh, to the ecosystem? Or I, I think I need a lot of big clarifications on, on the disservice means rather than maybe ecosystem services versus ecosystem disservices. That's what I understand. That's it uh, goes to that direction. So I, uh, I, am, I, I just skip this uh, question. So yeah, maybe I, I wanted to address a little bit with a concrete case study um, on the trade-off between multiple environmental services, at least, you know, in the context of C4 work on Red Plus. Because most of the time when countries designing their national policies, particularly on the forestry sector, and, and also there was um, a, a con a high debate on the trade-off, whether or not you're going for carbon sequestration, which is the carbon market that you're talking about, versus the biodiversity, because you know that the option that you're going to adopt a policies or you're going to adopt payment for environmental services that are targeted on carbon sequestration, which is maybe realizing a lot of reforestation, you know, newly plantation forest, it has to be also come with a trade-off with the biodiversity conservation objective. And, and, and this trade up sometimes it is very difficult to, to, to make in a way that it, is, it has to be very clear at the beginning what the government wants to do, what are the objectives and what are the national development goal or you know, the, the environmental protection goal that the government wants to do. And also it might has to also coming up with a holistic planning where maybe in some area you're implementing pest scheme where you focus on carbon sequestration but at the same time, you also need to have a proper policies in place that are also incentivize, you know, the forest protection area or the national park to continue the activities on biodiversity conservation. But at least in our global comparative study on Red Plus, where we're working in 17 countries across the world, that is the policies issue uh, that I receive a lot of debate in countries on how you balance between carbon sequestration services versus um, biodiversity conservation and it's still uh, a process where the country is defining its strategies also defining their financial resources in where they can take that straight off thank you both um, uh, and also um, how have your projects uh, and the projects that you've had studies on dealt with land tenure issues how, how would the projects address the different community groups, for example, women or other minority groups, um, in particular with relation to land tenure or where land tenure uh, is uncertain? So in the Regioso case, we only target the private lands uh, because we realize that there are, there will be different schemes between uh, the one with um, private and community lands or even state-owned land so however in other projects that we are also piloting so here uh, the ps is somehow uh, interpreted as a better or performance based uh, um, what to say it's like a community forest uh, permits so rather than having a business as usual community uh, forestry uh, or social forestry permits, here we enhance the indicators of people receiving as well as uh, how they, if they want to lengthen their, uh, renew their contract under the community or social forestry with ecosystem services indicators. So that's what we did in Indonesia. And as well as oh. in the Philippines, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, with the work at C4, we do not pilot any activities because our, our role is to provide evidence to inform decision making. And I mean, in our context, we do not pilot any case. But what we have seen with our case studies with the land tenure situation, it is much more complex than what we, we thought. Because giving the land use rights certificate, which means leaving the land tenure securities, does not solve the problem completely. I wanted to take an example because we are doing a case study uh, together with the Ivory 
Court of Government on Designing Payment for Environmental Services in several provinces. And what our study have showing that the perception of land tenure securities is very different. Uh, I mean, and, and also the case studies in Vietnam and, and also several other countries in the Mekong region as well. Because when we ask people, okay, so because you don't, you are not legal land owner, you do not have any land you write certificate, are you afraid of, of, of losing land and are you afraid of be, not being able to participate in PES and REF Plus? The, they simply say no. I mean, in many communities, they say no, because they believe that the customary rights is invalid. And in many cases, the government, even with our land tenure situations, the secure one, they still contracted the local people in a specific contract arrangement. What I also wanted to say is that giving a land use rights certificate doesn't mean that people can participate and benefit from PES, because most of the time in many countries, the area where the local people are given land tenure, tenure or, or given a land use rights certificate is a very degraded uh, forest area where it is extremely difficult for them to even signing into any contract per se, because environmental services over there, um, in a way, are not always attractive to, for investors. Um, when you're dealing with the beneficiary mechanism, particularly with the indigenous group and women, uh, at our uh, at CIPO, we do a lot of projects on beneficiary mechanism. And uh, what we have seen is that uh, in the current designs of beneficiary mechanism, most of the case study that we took, either at the national scheme or at the province uh, scheme, very little attention had been put uh, into a differences in how women and men perceives about benefit, how different uh, women and men perceives and prefer uh, the different method on payment uh, modalities, on payment time, and, and also in terms of the activities that, that they are see that are eligible to receive payment from payment for environmental services. Um, what we also have seen is that in many case study where you implemented the past scheme, you do not do a proper epic, do not do a proper prior informed consent at the very beginning. So later on, when you try to implement in the past scheme, many people refuse and walk away in the halfway of the program. So there is a need to pay attention to those special issues and do not assuming that, you know, giving them the land title, uh, it wouldn't have them. Uh, because follow up with the land title, there is a serious need to provide a lot of technical support and financial support for those communities um, to participate in a meaningful way in PEST program. And, uh, and there is a need to also bring in their voice and their interest into the desire of PEST scheme. Thank you. And there's been a, a lot of interest in how to monitor uh, and evaluate these PES schemes and to verify them. Um, in particular, the use of remote or satellite sensing uh, seems to offer real potential. And the question has been, uh, is this kind of monitoring and evaluation already in use or is it being considered? Uh, if not, what are the barriers to doing so? And also what other methods of monitoring and evaluation are being used in your two case study examples? So eGraph, we have uh, produced several tools in measuring the ecosystem services for uh, the watershed, uh, watershed function measurement. For example, we have uh, tools called uh, RHA, the Rapid Hydrological Assessment. So in this case, we can uh, emphasize that um, the measurement should be should bring uh, three perspectives first from the scientific ones and then from the local community as well as from the uh, public policy one and for the um, carbon we are also uh, publishing several uh, tools uh, in, in 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 i think in several languages as well and for the, also for the biodiversity measurement so you may uh, go to our website um, to check those uh, type of tools. However, I would I would like what I would like to emphasize here that for the MEA uh, of PES, especially in developing countries, it can be very expensive because, as you know, that uh, the baseline data is not available. That's the first thing, and then the second one, you need to ensure that the impacts really. Uh, being measured at a um, succinct uh, scale 
in our case, for example, we usually have the measurement at the sub-watershed level. Yeah, because um, if you uh, measure the scale in in a uh, area that are too large, then the real uh, initiative or the real uh, measure uh, the real impacts cannot be captured. Uh, that's uh, I that, that's I what I, I would like to highlight. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, and maybe if you uh, check the publications, the business case of the Rajoso, we also uh, mentioned there several tools uh, that I mentioned earlier. And there are also some working papers related to the Rejoso that uh, show uh, different tools uh, in measuring the water infiltration as well as the sedimentation rate in the in the watershed. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, oh, sorry. No, please go ahead. Sorry about that. I mean, like just to echo what what Lei has said that remote sensing and uh, offering a great opportunities for all of us to monitoring. But uh, just like with our uh, with our research at C4, I think that like um, the the effectiveness or, or the choice of the methodologies that you wanted to apply or win apply will also determine the levels of accuracies. I think that like there was a paper published by C4 and also Wanigan University uh, trying to compare different methodologies on impact evaluation using you know before after control intervention and then the, the method implying is that if you only comparing before and after you you have a different result but if you combining you know before in the intervention side compared to you know after it and then you know uh, with before after control in intervention side, combining at the same time, you offer a different result. So the methodology choose will also determine how accurate the effectiveness of the program is. And I also wanted to echo what uh, Lei said, is the problem in many development countries is that uh, remote sensing is extremely costly. And most of the time, the government has to fully rely on external support and international support to obtain those that are set and technical capacity of the government, particularly at the subnational government, also uh, um, are not always capable of doing those analyses. Another thing is also, and I mentioned also the politics of number and also the politics at the ground on how would you collect those data uh, and how you would reporting it also influence the outcome. Uh, and uh, another thing on the practical level is most of the time, uh, the boundaries between village are not always clear and that's why all of the land conflicts occur and uh, without a clear kind of land tenure boundaries and also the village boundaries it's also extremely difficult for you to monitoring the impact on the ground so that is my two cents adding to the discussion thank you very much and i think we just have time for one very one final very quick question um which people are quite interested in, which is regarding the term payment. Uh, payment implementation and practice has deterred some actors uh, from this question to participate because of this term payment. And some practitioners are recommending the use of incentives for ecosystem services instead. So what are your comments with relation to that? Yes, I uh, fully agree with this yeah, because I usually also when explaining about the PES, it's exactly it is a financial and non-financial incentive. However, one thing that also uh, I would like to bring is uh, the word of the investment and co-investment because uh, as you may see from my presentation, uh, the work uh, with eCraft uh, now evolved like, um, from the only what to say, piloting a PES, but also thinking the PES as part of the instruments for conservation investment. So we need to think and also to see broader financing instruments that accompany PES to ensure that it can be replicated and it can be sustainable beyond its PES contract. So that's also something I also would like to uh, bring uh, to the attention. Thank you. I mean, like the, the discussion, it just reminds me about my experience for so many years, but it's been in so many national workshops at different countries on how would they designing their pest scheme. And many countries spend the first couple of years, I mean, even in Vietnam, you know, for, for five or six years prior to pest program, 
They discuss about the terminologies, whether or not they use the term payment or compensation or, or the other the term. But uh, I guess like if you're looking realistically on, I mean, based on our 400 project that we review, most of the countries adopt the term payment because I think that like most of the government where we're working with, they wanted to differentiate between, you know, PES with the other scheme. Because to be, uh, in many countries, there is multiple kind of hybrid program uh, between, you know, uh, environmental protection hybrid with poverty reduction program. And in these cases, it didn't focus on the conditionality element of PES. And in these cases, most of the countries finally, after five or six years of long discussion, they wanted to adopt the term payment because it's clearly showing, you know, the conditionality aspect on it that only really deliver to me the environmental service that you promised in your contract, I pay for you. So this is a conditionality element that underlying many decisions of, of the countries or the project that we're working with, they wanted to employ the term payment. But absolutely, there was a, uh, I fully agree with Lays on the point that, again, you know, uh, PFAS or PES need to work in a complex a network of policies and it cannot be alone to address the problem. You need to couple PES with other environmental protection programs to address the drivers of deforestation and degradation. And um, in terms of the payment modality, there is limited uh, understanding and analysis to date about the non-financial motivation. I mean, we all wanted to com commodify and also to make, uh, to monetize uh, interest in term cash, but then many communities across the world participate in PES scheme, not primary for financial gain, but because of their social initiative. And in many cases, financial payment can destroy the good existing cultural behavior of the community as well. So these things should also need to be taken into account into the designing of not just only PES, but also the policy mix related to forestry policy. Thank you both for your um, very uh, clear, clear answers on those. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. We did have extend the time for, to allow for questions. We do have a lot more questions um, that have been posed to our speakers this morning, and these will be uh, posted on the D group. Uh, again, uh, that there will be a discussion and answering of these questions um, over the next two weeks. We will welcome all participants to join the D group um, and to engage in these discussions um, as much as possible. The webinar will be made available um, for all to, to view again um, on the, the D group as well. So again, please do sign up for that. But I would like to thank both of our speakers, so Dr. Berry, Maria uh, Lemona and Dr. Thuy Pham for their very interesting presentations and um, answering all of our questions so far. And welcome you all to join the D group uh, for further discussions and to the next upcoming webinar in this series, which will be in French this time uh, and will focus on valuation of ecosystem services uh, to be held later in May. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lucy, and all the WF and FAO colleagues. Thank Bye you. Now. Yeah. Thank you, Tui. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Good to talk with you again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Take care, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Keep healthy.